Well, 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 hello, hello. Um, another week has passed and here we are again, our weekly question and answers. We have um, gotten a lot of questions and it's always good to see. Well, one of you or some people of you cannot join right away, but um, we record it, of course, and then you can uh, see it again. So it's always nice to hear the great feedback. So thank you very much. And um, people ask me all the time, so um, what about um, Saddle Fit for Life and what's Schleser? Well, Schleser is my last name and I'm making Saddle since 1986. And since 2006, we dedicated an academy. What this is all about is for horses. Doesn't matter what type of saddles you ride or breeds you have. This is an academy what fits any type of saddle, not just Schleser saddles. Yes, we make saddles, but in a very small capacity. So this webinar is no matter if you have a Western saddle, English saddle, racing saddle, no matter what brand, the horse has an anatomy, a horse's back. It's the same no matter what brand you put on top. And we know that the riders have different shapes. Some people are taller, some people are smaller, and we have a completely different pelvises for male and female riders. Saddle Fit for Life is uh, my passion. This is what gets me in the morning out of bed to help as many horses as I can worldwide. And um, it's really, really cool to, to now say that we teach this literally around the world. Now, it's super fun to fly around all over the world, but it's also um, very frustrating because there's a lot of people there who ask to be helped and I can't be everywhere. So that's why we make this now available online. So if you go on saddlefitforlife.com, all these courses are online. The courses you see on the bottom, these are my last courses. My, we call them the intense courses this year. And other than that, we have trainers all over the world who do the online in the barn, hands-on course, but much of the stuff, what I learned over the last 42 years, and from veterinarian from all over the world, um, is what I share with you. We just had last week an, an incredible um, uh, webinar together with Dr. Catalina Tiersen. She's from South Africa, and you can see in the picture there is all different times, to, uh, parts of bones. And what I love, love, loved about it um, is she's a rider herself. And she always, with her partner together, know the horse either per video before they dissect the horse or actually met the horse. And they know what saddle have been written. So it's incredible to see how the bone, the bone tells the story. I like to call it the CSI saddle fitting. I learned so much from this veterinarian and we will do of course more joint webinars we do have that on our website uh, saddlefitforlifeacademy.com so you definitely want to see that i cannot tell you how informative this is so and before that all this knowledge i'm going to share with you and what makes saddle fit for life so special and the pinnacle of saddle fitting is this is really based on science, facts, and respect the law of nature. Now you say everybody says that there's eight different saddle fitting schools and everybody has a different opinion. But yet when, when you fly around the world, like I do, and you meet all these different veterinarians, they all pretty much learn the same anatomy, function, physiology, biomechanics, and it's pretty much the same, maybe different language. So if we have an, an, an united understanding, what the withers looks like, what the hind leg looks like, how the front legs are constructed and how the rib cage hangs off the scapular with the serratus muscle and the upper arm with the pectoralis muscle. So we get a good understanding. So now I'm gonna ask myself, why can saddle industry not just listen to these experts? And as a rider myself, uh, I got very frustrated because everybody told me something different before I really got into the, well, asking experts like this gentleman here, Dr. Gerd Horschman. You definitely don't want to miss our 
uh, webinar on August the 22nd. We have lots of very, very good speakers there. And he used to have his um, top, top veterinarian clinic at the German National Riding uh, at the school at the Olympic Center. And um, he stopped. He says, my, my code of honor is do no harm to the horse. And all I'm doing is injection and, 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 and numbing the nerves. And that's not really why I became a veterinarian. So he stopped that and uh, sold his clinic and went back to his profession as a berider. He learned to be a professional berider. Now he teaches worldwide the function and teaches from the veterinarian side because who better than he knows physiology, biomechanics, and what you do when you ride the horse bad. You know, there is uh, all these different opinions how we should ride a horse. And I understand there's also a lot of people who try good, but they get confused. So these people, I surround myself with people where there's some oomph behind it, where some logic behind it, rather than just because I say so. I was raised by my dad, who was a physics and math teacher. He says, you know, the person knows the how will always follow the person knows the why. So ask yourself the same question when people tell you something. Why is it like that? And why I continue to travel around the world, Dr. Solange Miguel, a wonderful veterinarian, and now teaches Saddle Fit for Life with all these veterinarians you see there on the picture on the right at the Sao Paulo University with Dr. Luli Kratchmir. She is a, a veterinarian chiropractor, and she understands very well. You know, if you're a body worker, chiropractor, acupuncturist, and you adjust your horse, and then you put a saddle on, which completely outdo the adjustment, how ludicrous is that? So if you are sick and tired because, let's use an analogy like flat tires. You constantly have a flat tire on the, and, and you, you get crazy. Why am I going to get flat tires? Of course, you can not ask the question why and keep buying the tires. Or maybe you get rid of the cause. Remove the end, the nails in the end of the driveway. So now you get rid of the nails. You don't have flat tires anymore. And that's what veterinarians and body workers look like. They say, okay, if saddles are built, it's not a holy grill and you can't adjust saddles, but if a saddle is adjust, so you actually damage the horse, damage the horse on bones, ligaments, nerves, muscles, okay? Then what good does it do when you adjust a horse with chiropractic or adjustment? So veterinarian body workers, of course, are, uh, they want to know about saddle fitting, not who, who has the most money, who sponsors the biggest show jumpers or just a shrider. They want to know what company fits saddles and a saddle fit for life. We want to share with you very simple facts what makes a horse happier. You know, nobody better than the racing industry. Here I am together in South Africa with uh, Graham. Graham uh, runs the Academy for the Jockeys in Durham, South Africa. And for them, it's all about if the horse is faster, that's a big deal, right? If there's less bleeding in the nose, isn't that something? If there's less heart rate, isn't that something? More ground covering. And who would have known that we have all this ability now to actually prove it to you, black and white. How? Gate analysis, computerized saddle pad, um, uh, uh, heart rate monitor. You know, these things are all available now and we can very clear, black and white, show you what the problem is. And then, of course, in England, I met um, a wonderful veterinarian. Here she's in our course, what we taught at Saddle Fit for Life. Dr. Sue Dyson, she has uh, several, several uh, wonderful articles, uh, veterinarian journals. And she wrote um, something about how to read the horse's pain. She wrote in a veterinarian journal, an ethogram. I can only, if you are a saddle fitter, or saddle manufacturer, encourage you, or a trainer, or even a, a really sincere horse lover, encourage you to, 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 to look at that. Our books are now in several different equine universities, and um, Suffering in Silence, the book on the left, got last year the best educational award in Kentucky at the film festival. Suffering in silence, you know, when the horse, if you look at the eyes, the ears, they don't know how to lie. You know, so sometimes it's very obvious. You come with this saddle, the horse instantly has white in the ear, the ears go back, tilts his head, mouth are open, and then you have another saddle and the, all this behavior is gone. 
I mean, how much more clear can that be? So let's say you have a saddle and it fits great and all of a sudden the horse starts to have this behavior. The saddle is made out of leather, some made of nylon. Some saddles have plastic trees, some have wood, some have synthetic, but most trees have a metal plate, like a horse has a metal plate in his mouth, which calls a bit, has metal on the foot. So when the hoof grows, the metal doesn't change. The fairy has to change the metal. And the same with the saddle fitting. When the trainer or you, even as a pleasure rider, sit on the horse's back, that horse's shoulder will get bigger. If you are a very good dressage rider or good jumper rider and you focus very good movements to enhance the muscles even stronger, that body will change. If you do not change that metal plate like you need to do on the hoof, guess what will happen? The nice horse all of a sudden starts to refuse or is the dressage, you get a four beat canter, you have a lateral walk, right? So these are signs when the saddle needs to be adjusted. So all this is now available to all fingertips. And it really doesn't matter if you do dressage or Western or bareback rider. You know, so horses come in all different shapes and not just like the high withers and the mutton withers, but horses like human are dominant on one side than the other. Very few, few humans are amidexic. The majority of the humans are right-handed. Sure, there's some people who are left-handed, but you will see the majority of the horses, when they graze, they graze with the right leg solid and the left leg is forward. Dr. Kerry Ridgway wrote a book about it called the High Heel and Low Heel Syndrome. Okay, so we see out of 10 horses, seven, seven look like this here with the bigger left shoulder. Now, if you do not, if you do not adjust the saddle accordingly, veterinarian call that an orthopedic adjustment, okay, the horse will be damaged on the left shoulder. There's several pictures, even YouTube's on it. And as a jumper, look at this one here with the green fences. Just a little bit, the saddle goes to the right, the left shoulder kicked it over, and then the left leg sticks out. In bad cases, check this guy out here. He lands always on the right side of the horse's body when they jump. Okay, so the metal, okay, reinforced tree, you can see it here, okay, sits behind the shoulder. And if you don't do an orthopedic adjustment, then the bones and the cartilage, you see here the cartilage, will be damaged. And that's a fact, you know? So for me, uh, I love this video because if you see what's happening, um, one leg goes forward, then the shoulder, pow, comes back. So people said, oh, I learned in the Society of Master Saddle, in the saddle fitting school, we have to put the saddle two inches further back because that's how far back the, in the shoulder goes. Uh, excuse me? The shoulder goes sometimes back over four to six inches. So if you put the saddle four to six inches, you're sitting on the croup. So we need to look what they've done in the past when they fitted saddles of function and not because somebody's had an idea and says, okay, let's, let's fit it for fashion or, or because I'm a, a, a good producer of a product. You know? So if, if we look how these shoulders move, okay, and we want to stop the horses from crippling here through the shoulders, we need to look at the front how the saddle fits. This is the cross section of the withers. Sometimes you have big, big dry spots and we need to look at the saddle, how it moves. In the back, here's a horse on the treadmill in the water. Look at the back. You see the ring of lights here? The old cavalry officers, they call that the ring of light or the dark zone. No pressure can be past this cursor right there. And you can see how the whole spine moves and you can uh, run it again when it comes to the front. You can see how the shoulder comes backwards. Every time the horse steps forward, shoulder comes back and you look in the back how they swing back and forth. So. A lot of a lot of horses, okay. A lot of horses have issues, and it is an alarming amount of horses we have with kissing spine. It is ridiculous that the English riding horses have twice the amount of kissing spine, twice the amount of kissing spine than Western horses. So of course, I wanted to know why, you know, and I 
got to the bottom of this and I says, okay, this really doesn't have to have. Last week, I learned that the transitional vertebrae, you can see this is a normal lumbar here, how it sticks out. And I learned that the nerve goes on the bottom. Dr. Catalina Tiersen says, this here is abnormal. And then the nerve is on top. Even a pad, subtle pad, what's too long, will hit that nerve and the horse is really, really uncomfortable. Here you see the ring of light again, or like the soldier called it the dark zone, no saddle can hit there. So it needs to end here. And very hard to detect horses with transitional vertebrae. But she told us in that seminar that when that um, abnormal bone sticks out and the majority is on the left, that's poking in the soft tissue and the horse will wear over to the right. Okay, so we all learned and anybody who's went to uh, a certain riding program, it doesn't matter if you're an eventer, what I was, or a dressage or jumper rider. The training scala is very important. That's how we train our horses. And number five is straightness, right? And we want to make the horse straight because we build our houses straight, but sometimes the horse is not straight, okay? They have these transitional vertebrae or they are born with uneven shoulders. Then you will have some people who says, you know what, to pop a riding, and I learned that in the training scala to ride the horse straight, I'm gonna ride him straight. That is just as ridiculous if you're an, an amazing soccer player, but you have a massive bunion on the right foot and the trainer says to you, I'm gonna train you, be a good soccer player. And then that bunion, when you properly train, will go away. No, okay? That is how the horse is born with that abnormality. And that's why they call it a orthopedic adjustment. All right, so we have so many, so many articles, so many videos, so many answers from so many different universities. And I'm sorry, I, I took a little bit long this time, but I really wanted to bring this across. This is the last uh, webinar I do this from my home here in Florida. I'm leaving Monday, I can't believe it, back to Toronto. And then we will do it there again. But I really wanted to share with you um, the, the people who want to help the horses, they understand what Dr. Catalina Tiersen says, you can't train pain. You can wait until the nerves are numb and after 20 minutes, they don't react to the nerve pinching, okay? But you're training the horse upside down. So all these behavior, sometimes it's a saddle fitting issue. So for me, my biggest fear is that there's a lot of, a lot of bad riding and as a trainer, judge, international competitor myself, I can say that because I was taught to ride the hand horse off the forehand and get the horse to swing his back and get his haunches underneath to get the weight off the forehand. This is why I adore Dr. Ged Heuschmann because he will take no bullshit. You know, he will, he will call you out if you abuse your horse. And unfortunately, in today's world, sometimes people do nasty stuff to the horse just to get the ribbon, right? So um, you do not get the swinging back and the haunches underneath when you crank and pull and kick. So we as saddle fitter sometimes see horses, young horses who are seven or eight years already with the sway back. And we also as saddle fitters or saddle agronomist or equine agronomist, we see horses or saddles what have fitted these seven different ways, you know, closed pin fit, in hyperextension fit, combination fit, bridge fit, and uh, modern sport fit. I mean, there are so many different types of people adjust the saddle, yet the anatomy of the horse is always the same. You know, that kills me. It makes me absolutely mad when people say, oh, we teach saddle fitting to the anatomy of the horse, and yet it's on the spine. They make a saddle, what is sitting on the spine? The anatomy of the horse is they have a spine, they have ligaments and they have spinal nerves. Remember what I was saying to you earlier? Western saddle have half the amount of kissing spine than horses. Look at this here. This is a typical Western tree. 
I don't care if you get a Western tree for $15,000 or one out of China or India for $150, okay? They are all are the same. The bars are always four inches away, never ever on the spine. And you know how many saddles have very, very narrow channels? A lot, a lot. Why? Because some saddle fitters or companies who make saddles like this believe, hey, you know, when we make a saddle, what is nice and narrow on the spine, it can hit and fit every type of horse. They call it close spin fit. Close spin fit means you see a close up from a um, vertebrae, here the spinal channel, here you see this, uh, this is says nerves, and this back muscle, the multifidus, you have it too as a human, very important. That gives the spine the strength. So if you have a channel that is too narrow and atrophies that muscle, okay, the horse will not go like this chestnut. It will hollow, has a wrong bend. Look how heavy this horse is on the forehand and his hind leg is a la la land. Okay, so we can, whatever we want, we, we can fit saddles. Some people say, oh, it should fit like a bridge fit. Again, anybody who understand a little bit of physiology or anatomy or biomechanics, they know if you push and poke into muscle, it contracts. And this bridge fit where it only sits on one end and the other, digs into the loin and it's not carrying in the center, the horse will not oscillate the back, swing the back. If the back can't come up, the hind leg cannot come under. Now you can say, I want it because I want that back to drop so the horse does not uh, get into a canter. Some gated saddles are built like that, it's horrible, but we get this false oscillation. Look how far back the hind leg is here. We got a great high shoulder, but the back is way down. Okay, so you say, oh yeah, this is just uh, in that sport and I don't do this. But you know how many, how many, many, many top international horses are showing like this? Okay, the only difference is they crank the face down and hind leg is still out, land super hard here. So if people, if people pay a lot of money for a saddle, and pay a lot of people money to fit saddles. And these saddle fitters do not have the analogy or the understanding from physiology or anatomy. This is why Sonia and I created this for you. We wanted to share with you, there is a proper way to do it. We call it function fit. Function fit means we do not put intense pressure on the spine. We're not going over 4.66 kPa kilopascal um, is the same like we use that in Germany and North America. Uh, people say pounds per square inch. So at a certain amount of pressure, the muscle will atrophy. And when the muscle is atrophied, the horse cannot use his back. And therefore the little joints and ligaments all go bye-bye. All right. So we need to understand all these little uh, capillaries, okay? Imagine you have elastic band around your fingertips, right? You don't ride with elastic band around your fingertips because it hurts crazy. So a saddle, what has too high pressure, use a computerized saddle pad where we can see that, yeah? or it doesn't have properly weight bearing surface, it atrophies the entire back. And if the horse has no muscle, okay? The worst case scenario, the horse will canter like this, absolutely rigid, hollow, pushes down the neck, there is no engagement in the sacroiliac joint. So it is so easy with tools such as this to have gait analysis, see the heart rhythm, see as the horse is stressed. All this is available. And I, I encourage everybody to ask the questions, why? Why is my horse doing this? And why, why have people always said in, since 400 years at the Spanish riding school, the saddle will never fit, never fit the horse if it doesn't fit the rider. Because if you have a cramped posture, I have a lot of people who says, but I'm a professional. And I'm, I rode international Grand Prix dressage in a male saddle and I have managed and I'm okay with this. It's been shown numerous times, they sit twice as hard into the horse's back 
And it's just a matter of time when the disc, the joints on the hip or knee, or the soft tissue will be an issue. It's, it's, it's physiology, it's anatomy, it's, it's the law of nature. <laughs> so when people understood this since 400 years in the Spanish riding school, and says, if the rider doesn't sit in the gender appropriate saddle, in other words, has a pliable seat, yeah, will hurt the horse, the horse will suffer. So I got a little carried away because um, again, I see it almost every single week that people call us and says, oh my God, I just spent so much money and I had three different saddle fitters and everybody says something different. This is for you to learn the Saddle Fitter Life Academy. We have uh, many, many videos, uh, some courses for free, some of course cost money. So Sonia, if there is uh, already a question or so, I'm happy to answer questions from our audience at this stage. Yep, I have a question. Um, my dear 17 year old horse has shown the same sweat patterns with three to four different saddles in the past 10 years. One palm size dry patch on both sides, right behind the top back edge of the scapula. So can pressure mapping help find out what it is? What are some possible causes? Um, and is there any other way that she can sort of determine what uh, the issue is? Yeah. So. When we look at um, area where the saddle sits, I, this is typical what we see on horses, a palm size behind the edge of the scapular. Okay, in this area here, this is a cross section. Here's the long spinal processes. Here you see spinalis, the trapezius sat muscle, very thin, that gray little thing, the rhomboidus, a uh, rhomboid. And then we have the latissimus and the longissimus. So all these different muscles here, they kind of get squished. Why are they getting squished? Because at the front area, the ribs are at a 70 to 86 degrees. So that they fall pretty steep down. So if the saddle wouldn't have a gullet plate there or reinforced pommel, it would crush the bone and will really, really hurt the horse on the withers. So it needs a structure to hold. Now in the back, the back of the saddle, the area, the ribs are flatter. So we call it the supporting surface. And in the front, where the dry spots most of the time occur, we have that falling surface. So there's tremendous amount of pressure. So the easy answer is, it is not that if the dry spot is big, if the dry spot is big and it dries very fast after you showered your horse, so let's say you finished riding and you see this massive dry spot, you hose the horse off and boom, instantly you see that dry spot. So that is super hot. So you have a huge issue. If it dries even with all the rest of the horse, you're okay. So people say to me, but I heard dry spots are bad. If the pressure is over 4.6 kPa. So yes, your answer is uh, your question. Can it help with pressure mapping? Yes, or my first, I always encourage people when the weather of course allows, finish riding, hose the whole horse up, take the water off and pay attention what area dries fast. If the area on the front area dries fast, you gotta get your saddle adjusted. Because you have three different saddles, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all fitted differently or better or worse, just different companies. Sometimes I have seen people have all the money in the world and they have every saddle they can have and every saddle fitter and they got everything out. So it's not a muscle, uh, it's not a money thing. It's not, they don't have the option or they don't have the variety of experts. If, if, and that's a big pet peeve of mine. If the tree gets only adjusted in the angle, it will never help the horse because you also got to adjust the tree in the width. The spacing, let me get a saddle. The spacing right here where my pinky and my index finger is, okay? This from there to there, okay? That needs to be adjusted independent, independent from the angle of the saddle. Most saddles just do this, kind of like a nut crack. So my biggest encouragement is get it checked either with, as I said, with the water or with a computerized saddle pad. I hope 
that answer was sufficient. <laughs> Sonia, do you mind asking if that was okay? I think that would that's a good explanation. Um, okay. I actually do have additional questions. And what I'm going to do is very quickly take over the screen for a sec because it's about a very specific product. And they're asking about what our opinion is of the Prestige RP Girth. And I'll show my screen now just so everyone is able to see it as well. And so this is the Girth. And this is the dressage version. So I'll let you take over the screen again, and then you can provide an explanation as to your opinion of this particular girth. Okay, so if you would leave it there for a second, Sonia, before I take this screen back. Now, what I like and what I've seen in army saddles or Western saddles, they call them diamond girth. They're eight inch wide and then they go very smooth, narrow to the elbow. What they want is to have an eight inch weight bearing surface on the sternum. A horse has a split sternum, distribute the pressure. And then most of the time it's a cotton string girth in the army or in the Western world. That girth goes very narrow on the elbow and towards the buckles. This particular one, it's way above eight inches, so it's massive. And you see it doesn't gradually comes down. It doesn't transition smooth. Now, every boxer, my dad was a featherweight boxer. You always taught us kids, when you box, you protect the part where your sternum ends. That's the solar plexus. And for your trainers, body workers, when you do the belly lift, you hit that spot. So they lift the belly. Some saddle, some saddle girth actually put a hard rubber bottom on there. And that, when you girth it up, pushes on the solar plexus. And then the company says, oh, with this girth, the horse has instantly elevation. What a nonsense. And how can I say that? How can I make comments like this? Because I was in Germany. See, this one does not have it, but there's other uh, girth what has these extra pressure pads so the horse lifts this this girth here what i don't like so much is that is way too long and it hits that solar plug plexus area too broad i'm sorry not too long and um, it has uh, a quite a bit an edge where it comes from that big donut down to the actual girth so how can i say what is good for and not for good for the horse one of our um, trainers in europe she also tested for the Dutch Olympic team, all kinds of equipment. And there was a girth back there, what looked similar to this. And the horse instantly had an increased heart rate, right before the guy even got on the horse. And guess what? We know when the horse has increased heart rate, that is a super stress level. All right, so this here, um, I have no testing seen on that girth. It's pretty uh, uh, fancy. You see how it gaps in front and the back. Um, I haven't seen any computerized saddle pad. The only thing immediately say, why such a big spot when it hits the solar plexus? Not my uh, first choice. Okay, so let's go to the next question. Okay, so the next question I have is, if you would like to explain the topic of girth from Friday to explore a little bit more why cotton non-elastic girth is better than the elastic one. And she shared her info with a few friends, but it seems to be difficult to process because you can think that adjusted cotton girth is not giving the space to take a breath. So it doesn't expand with the chest, which is why a lot of people have some difficulty understanding why um, non-elastic is actually better than elastic and if we can provide any links to additional sources or studies to um, support this. Okay, so you can do that, Sonia. You can provide those links. I like to um, um, give it another quick 
um, goal in terms of, I want to quick explain a different analogy with the girth. A good fitting saddle should fit like a good fitting helmet. What I mean with that is when you have a saddle pad, I'm sorry, a, um, a saddle, you do not need to have a super tight girth. Think about a helmet. If the helmet fits correctly in the length, front to back, left to right, the width, and then the angle on the side of the head, how tight do you make that chin strap? Most people don't make it super tight. Why? Because then your TMJ, you can't move your jaw properly. And when we as people can't move our jaw, when we can't chew, that actually will give us a little problem with balance. So the old riding helmets, right? Or any riding helmet, what you have to super tight, those helmets fitted so shitty, even with the super tight elasticized strap, what was super annoying for the riders, the first thing what fell off the head when you fell off the horse was the helmet. So for me, and I see it over and over with the Western horses or with other jumping or dressage saddles, the girth should fit snug rather more on the loose side than on the tight side. Yet every single elastic girth, what is longer than two inches on each side, is over tightened because think about it, the billet of your saddle goes through a roller buckle and it's a pulley action. Without elastic, most riders will never over tighten the girth. So what you probably noticed and heard when you were riding and learning to ride, that says, okay, when you go on, you put the saddle on, don't put it on too tight too first. So you put it on, then you lead your horse to the mounting block, then you regirth again. Then you ride a little bit around and then you regirth again, right? So the idea came actually out of the racing world where they said, and I, I seen it myself, you throw the saddle on, you go right away to the top so you don't have to go through the regirthing because you get 10 bucks a horse to gallop. So obviously it has to go fast to the next horse. So then I thought, oh, that's a good idea. So that's much better for the horse. And yet again, again, do it yourself. Put an elastic band around the chest and start jogging in your neighborhood, right? You say, oh yeah, it expands great, but every time it expands, it contracts. So every time you inhale, you need to stretch that elastic and very quick, you're gonna say, oh, maybe I don't wanna use so much energy to constantly stretch that elastic. You're gonna go, <laughs> you breathe flat, okay? And that's why you will never see on Western horses who do cow painting, barrel racing, uh, rodeo, uh, whatever, any girth with elastic, right? So any hardworking horses never have a girth with elastic. The elastic has only one function, to get the unevenness in the billets, not to expand while the horse expands. I've seen it many times and we have proven this and on the racetrack in Singapore and on the racetrack in South Africa, the jockey actually was racing an exercise saddle, they have racing saddles, tiny little wee things for the racing day, and an exercise saddle, what they use every day when they train the horses. And the coach almost had a nightmare. I couldn't believe the girth was not dangling, but not super, super tight. But the saddle didn't go anywhere, just like a helmet, it doesn't go anywhere. So if you have a cotton girth or a string girth, a girth with little or no elastic, A, you never over girth. And if you do it the way you've been taught, Gentle, regirth at the mounting, regirth after your first five minute ride. You don't need to have a girth what constantly is tight. When the horse exhales, there will be for a minute where the girth is kind of loose. So if he inhales, there's nothing against the chest and he inhales a lot. So hopefully Sonia finds you some links and can show you the studies. Try it yourself or buy yourself a heart monitor. You get them as cheap as $39. And, and ride with the girth with elastic and without elastic. And data doesn't make stories. It's pretty straightforward. One of the things I'd like to add in regards to the elastic girth is that none of the girths that are available on the market today adequately protects the horse from over tightening, which is a huge issue when it comes to elastic girths. So the material is one problem, but the rider not understanding the amount of tension they actually need 
is what will cause a decrease in the performance of the horse. Yeah, so um, it, it's hard to comment because I can see where the question comes. You know, you can say, you know, um, it would be really cool if we could have a girth what gives every time the horse expands, you know? And it, it, you think it's right, but think about the, uh, the effect. The animal, the horse is a flight animal. And when a girth, what is constantly tied, gives you the same effect like a boa constrictor, what does the snake do? Every time the animal exhales, it goes tighter. The horse breathes a little bit in, it goes tighter. So an elastic girth, A, like Sonia just said, very often gets over tightened and B always is on the chest and always gives that feeling of strangle. So here is another problem I see with uh, girth with elastic. This is a study done in uh, Zurich. Horse C, you see the sheared skin here, all that. You can see that often when the saddle moves a lot, right? So what we have here is a saddle, what doesn't fit? The girth width's over tightened. And if you have somebody grab your lower arm, one hand twist to the right, the other hand twist to the right, to the left. You got, I don't know, what, what do you call that? Chinese burn or something like this, Sonia? I, I, every country uses a different. Oh thing. yeah, I forgot what kind of sunburn. <laughs> we used to torture each other as kids by doing that. Yeah, right, and that's kind of, what you see there on, on the picture see when the skin starts shearing. So you don't want that cause from a, a, a girth what has too much elastic or a saddle what slides all over the place. And one last thing I'll add about girths is most people don't check the tension in the right spot. They don't realize that the horse has a hollow just behind the elbow and the best place to check girth tightness is actually against the sternum. Yes. So moving on, I have another question. Could a misplaced shim cause the panels to shift? Okay, so um, let's use this here. Let's say a horse has unevenness in the shoulder or it's really, really hollow behind the shoulder on this horse. Um, think about a shim like in your shoe. Okay, you have a special shim in your shoe and what would that do if that thing is placed wrong or it moves around? So it actually does more damage than good. So anytime you put a shim in underneath the saddle, it needs to be secured to the saddle. Most saddle pads would have shim pockets, okay? Get those saddle pads, what you can attach to the saddles, to the D-ring, or sometimes they slide onto the sweat flap, or if they have nothing, it doesn't hurt the leather and it doesn't hurt the saddle pad, get a double-sided tape from Home Depot or from any store. So the pad, the shim pad doesn't slide around. This is the worst thing what we see. Sometimes people use shimming. You have to because there's no saddle fitter, uh, it's out of your budget. Um, it helps you because you have a couple of horses to ride. But think about if you have shims in your shoes and they move around, how painful that is, okay? So you gotta keep, just like in your shoes, your thorics or the shims, solid, quiet, so when your foot lands, it lands on the right spot. Same with the shims underneath the saddle. You got to make sure the shim pad or the shim itself is attached to the saddle. There's a lot of movement in the horse's back. Okay, and I have another question. Are you able to explain the flex tree? Okay, so let me um, find a tree here. Okay, so this is a tree what has webbing and this material here, it's a polyurethane. You see the spring steel attached here. Okay. And by using different thickness of spring steel, okay, or double it sometimes, okay, you get the flexibility on the saddle. So this, you can see how much that tree flexes. Okay, a flex tree moves and flexes when the horse's back goes up and down. And not this particular one because they put a metal plate in here what has 16 rivets on the bottom, what connects with the rivets and the plate on top. If I put that in a machine what spreads this, 
Okay, I will break the radius is different on the bottom than on the top. I will actually rip the, well, the rivets and break the metal. So this type of uh, metal plate is not meant to adjust. Here's another flex tree. You can see how it flexes. And you can see here, it's a metal plate. It has no rivets in the center. Okay, it's only a touch on the side. So here you can adjust the tree, narrow, medium or wide angle. Okay, so a flex tree, um, many, many companies use this now. They don't use wood trees anymore. Wood trees break very fast, twist very fast. You can't do any orthopedic adjustments with a wood tree. So there's a, it's a nice, inexpensive tree. You can buy it as a manufacturer, but you've got to weigh a minimum of 180 pounds. Well, wood trees are started to make in the early 1700s. Back then, always guys were riding. Okay, Late 70s, majority of the riders are now women. And the most women who ride are not over 180 pounds. So if you have a wood tree and it has steel all the way around with lamination, that wood tree will flex. They call it a spring tree, but not a uh, um, a flex tree when you weigh at least 180 pounds. Otherwise, the tree would constantly break. So a flex tree allows the saddle manufacturer to use different spring steel to make it any flexibility. For example, I'm 200 pounds, my spring steel needs to be thicker. So my weight is not just in the center. If a lady who weighs 125 pounds or 150 pounds, the spring steel will be a little less. So it gives more because I learned, I don't know about you guys, but I learned the most important aid is your seat. How you implement your weight into the saddle to the horse. The flex tree also allows, as I said, the adjustment in the tree angle. The difference, many people say, well, what saddle? can do both tree angle and tree width. That would be an adapt tree. The ad adapt tree, we patented that in 1996, can have the tree width separate from the angle. Sometimes horses are really narrow when they have been starting to ride in the shoulders. You notice when you groom the horse underneath the chest between the front legs, you can barely move the brush back and forth, okay? The shoulders are narrow, the tree width would be narrow, and the rib cage is flat down. So the tree width between my fingertip is narrow, but the angle is flat. Now you start to train the horse. The rib cage comes up. Let me find you a slide. I hope I have it on this PowerPoint. We'll demonstrate when the horse lifts his thoracic sling, the rib cage comes up. So Sonia, maybe you can look at that. If you have a um, slide, I don't think I have it on this here. No, I don't have it on this one. So when the horse gets um, more ridden, just like humans, when they start to get more posture, doesn't matter what, uh, what age they grow, it's posture. So the horse's ribcage will lift up and the shoulder gets wider. And then the tree gets steeper. The shoulder angle gets steeper. Let me demonstrate that with my pony leg here. Here's the lower leg. Here's the humerus. Here's the shoulder blade. Okay, so where my, where my hand is here and my hand here, these are, there are muscles to the rib cage. So when they get wider, this comes out and this goes up. And then this angle goes this way. So you can see Sonia is putting it up. This is a super, super uh, explanation here. Sonia, show us the horse on the left where the elbow and the sternum is. So maybe on the mouse, you can see on the bottom, on the left, you will see, you look in a horse right from the front, the elbow and the sternum is one level. Exactly, so that line. So now you look on the other side, you'll notice that the sternum lifted. The whole rib cage came up. 
same what you would do when you have a slouch seat. Now all of a sudden you grew because you have a posture. What also happens is look at how the shoulder dropped that arrow um, Sonia just put on, all right? So same thing, when you stand up, shoulders come back and they drop. And then what also happens is they go wider, the shoulders. So between the chest, all of a sudden you notice, wow, look, how I can brush my horse. There's a lot of space between his chest. Look how good this boy or girl is trained. You think they only go wider on the bottom? No, they go wider on top. That's why the adapt tree can individual adjust the tree in the tree width and in the angle. And because we have so many more research and so many, many more knowledge, it can also allow an orthopedic adjustment if it's necessary because it's not muscle, it's bone deformity. Thank you. Okay, Sonia. Okay, so I'll, I'll let you take over the screen again. And I have some additional questions. Yeah. So the first one is, what would you recommend, or sorry, would you recommend any particular short girth? And the next question is, what do you think about reindeer hide as a saddle pad? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I do the saddle pad first because it's an easy answer. Nobody has done so much research when it comes to saddle pad than the guy here in the brown shirt. This is Christian Payham, and he's a professor at the University of Vienna. And um, he has researched what is the best saddle pad for horses. Second came sheepskin. Number one is deer skin. So that is definitely, if you find one of those and can afford those, the best saddle pads based on his research. The second question was, what's the best girth? The best girth is not too long elastic, the right length. People ask me, what is the right length? It should be, everybody knows if it's a short girth we're talking about, it should be over the um, elbow. But you see the C elbow, this edge here, where my mouse is or my cursor, okay? That's the muscle, what is attached to the humerus, what holds the rib cage to the front leg. That's a pectoralis muscle. Little kids, when they tickle themselves here on the edge of the pectoralis muscle, it's super annoying. You will never find, you will never find on an army saddle or Western saddle, a saddle that has to work for 100% and function when they're out there the whole time, roping a cow or going up and down the hills what will be too short in the buckle on the edge of the muscle, right? And it's kind of like constantly digging in every step the horse does. And the horse is not lifting a thoracic sling. What they have is the girth as high as possible, just below, just below the widest part of the horse. So pretend my fingertips is the withers and my bottom part of my hand is the sternum. There is some part on the horse on the side where the horse is the widest. If the girth comes as high as possible, not to the widest, the buckle will actually pull away from the horse. And the best part is you're already at the widest, underneath the widest part of the horse's rib cage. Okay, so if the rider leans this way or that way, that means the girth needs to jump over something what is wider and higher, it won't do it. It stabilizes the saddle from falling left to right. The best girth is what is long enough to get over the edge of this pectoralis muscle, but short enough so it does not go on the widest part of the horse's rib cage. Material, sometimes the most inexpensive uh, nylon girth works just, just as good and you can keep it nice and clean. Most horses have girth issue because it's filthy. The sweat is very acidic and the girth is not cleaned properly. Most leather girth are very inexpensive and they have chemical tanned. So they will, when the horse sweats, the tanning comes out and it creates a problem. So with a good girth, uh, they use 100% veg tan and this veg tan leather is very expensive, 
but you can wash it. Okay, and if you don't wash it after riding and leave the sweat there, it cracks the girth. So if the horse cannot use nylon girth or a neoprene girth because it's very thin skinned or doesn't like that material and it needs to be leather girth, always go with wash leather and always after riding, same what you do with the bits, wash the sweat off. And while it's wet, put on not baby oil, not needs for oil, an oil, what we call leather oil, and there's lots of good uh, uh, mark out there. I wouldn't put a cream there or any kind of other stuff. Girth galls are very often a function of um, the way the rib cage are changed, where the girth groove is in relation where the shoulder blade ends, and of course, clean. Right? So if you say, I never change my undershirt or my underpants or my socks, I don't care, I live by myself, I don't care how it stinks. The skin will react to the acid your body exposed when you sweat. And that is very often what we see, not just on saddle pads, the worst are the actual girth. So the best girth, a clean one and the right length and not too long elastic. Okay, and one final question is for flocking material, what is the best? Well, it's, it's, it's really um, interesting. And when I say that is there's again, a lot of opinion. <laughs> I like to go and I won't like to understand why do I need an, on an English saddle, um, wool flock saddle, a material, what is hard for all you folks who as old as I am or have ridden more than 30 years or 40 years, you will remember those saddles back then, they were all firm, almost hard, the panel. All of you Western riders, you will know if you take the Navajo pad up and you touch the sheepskin underneath the Western saddle, there's that nice fluff sheepskin, but bang, there's something hard, the bar of the tree. The Western pad, the Navajo pad, half an inch, quarter of an inch, three quarter of an inch. Okay, it's not very fluffy, it's firm. If you have a mattress, what is super, super soft, you can't walk next day because the mattress didn't give you the support in your spine when you rest in sleep. Saddle stuffing in the old days when it was function and it had a purpose for the horse to protect the back was horse hair or deer hair. They used horsehair or deer hair. They created a panel that could be formed to the horse's back and create substance. It created an area for the weight got distributed. The hardest part I had to learn in 1978, that's when I started my apprentice, is have a loose fluffy wool which was 60% synthetic, sorry, wool, 40% synthetic. So the blend, wool 60%, 40% synthetic, gives you the same as hair, horse hair or deer hair. So you had that fluffy wool and then you had to fill a mattress. And the whole time you had to leave your hand there to make it firm and flat to distribute the tree and the pressure of the tree to increase a larger weight bearing surface. Really, really hard. Many, many saddlers have uh, problems in the wrist, in their hands, tendonitis, arthritis, because you gotta keep the pressure there. All of a sudden, Marketing made it, oh, horses are sensitive. We breed the horses more sensitive now. Let's make it fluffy. So synthetic wool gets added, a bouncy wool gets added, and the panels are super, super fluffy. That is kind of like somebody says to your car, oh, the car would perform much better if you make it very, very, very low tire, low air on your tire. The car performs like horrible, and the rim of your tire will eat the tire. So Obviously, a certain pressure needs to be in the tire to get the good drive and to not get the rim of the tire onto the road. And the same with flocking. The way I have learned, the best wool is 40% synthetic, 60% wool. Keep it nice and flat and firm so you have a nice weight-bearing surface. Every saddle, it's super easy for manufacturers who fill saddles. Now you don't even need trades people anymore. You just fluff it in by, by, by a compressor, so fast, so easy stuffed, 
but the tree falls through like the rim on the tire on the car. Horrible for the horses. How can I say it? Well, again, in 2018, the um, University of Zurich posted in England at the Saddle Research Trust annual meeting, a poster. There they shown um, how horrible today's English saddles and the stuffing is because the twist is so narrow and the tree falls through. Let me see if I find it quick here. And um, it, it's, again, I can only say I'm not as smart as the veterinarians or professors who, who, no, I don't have it on the slideshow. But um, it is something what I take to heart, you know? I know how to make out of a flat skin leather and certain materials, certain foam, certain materials, a saddle. I'm an artist when it comes to riding a horse or making a saddle. But when it comes to academics, studying, research, understanding to the milli detail how a horse or a human works, then I go to the expert to study for this and not somebody who has some opinion what wool has it better because of it creates faster sale or easier production. So I like to go and follow the law of nature. I like to go with what helps the horse rather than destroys the horse. And for me, um, that's my passion. And, and I want to share that with you, that you also have to start to ask the question, you know, um, is that really... Is it really something I, I makes sense to me? And ask them, you know, how you do it, why you do it, the way you do it. You know, most people, you know, who really want to, to fit it right, they are saddle ergonomists. We have this now since 14 years all over the world. And you can do this online. You can learn to become saddle ergonomist. It's a, a person who fits saddles and riders, two horses and riders. And, and it's based on science and follows law of nature there's a lot of people who get really upset because there's a lot of people do a weekend course or they call themselves saddle fitters and the customers print t-shirts and says oh i had a saddle fitter you know what that means an individual who does precision guesswork based on unreliable data provided by those questionable knowledge you know so why would i I would ask, where, where do you get this information from? Are, are you a professor? Are you a veterinarian? Do you have this? And if they don't, then why would I listen to them? I go to the people who really put no, do not do any harm to the horses. And those are the veterinarians. Those are the top researcher people in the world. So again, don't end up cripple your own body. But the worst you can do is when the light of the eye of the horse disappears. There's so many, many horses who are psychological set, checked out. You know, just go ahead and do what you need to do. I hope it helped a little bit this uh, uh, today. And I enjoyed it tremendously with you again. I'm looking forward to talk to you soon. And um, thanks very much. Sonia is always there for you guys. Um, please visit our saddlefitforlifeacademy.com. Lots of information for you. Email us as uh, Sonia at saddlefitforlife.com. She can help you as well. I like to say goodbye with one of my favorite little videos. And if I can play it, that would be good. If not, I have to trick my computer. <laughs> Here we before, go. Before you play that, though. Okay, before I play that, yes. Sorry. Um, I want to invite all of our people on the video to check out our Facebook page and especially read the very last post. And Joachim, you're going to love this about our chicken dinner story. Do you remember that? Yes. So if you want yeah. someone who doesn't understand the why, or if you want just a good little laugh, check out our little chicken dinner story and you'll understand the importance of knowing why things are done. Not just following tradition, not just doing it the way it's always been done, but understanding the why so that you can actually start to progress. Excellent. That's We should incorporate that again, huh? Because that brings it really home, doesn't it? It does. And people quite, uh, they quite love that little story as well. And for those of you who have submitted questions that we didn't have time to get to, we do save them. So we try and answer them in the next webinar. So if your question wasn't answered, join us next week and we'll answer those questions first. And uh, as always, thank you for joining us and thank you for making this a, a success.
Thank you, Sonia.